In March 2021, Deshaun Watson was first accused of sexual assault. Since then, 23 more lawsuits have been filed against him. The lightest alleging sexual assault, the harshest alleging rape. In a 17-month span, he hired a total of at least 66 masseuses. For some of these women, he coerced them into signing an NDA. That NDA was written by a member of the Houston Texans organization. These allegations are not easy to read about. One alleges that he grabbed a woman's head with his legs and tried to force her to perform a sex act on him. The descriptions of Watson's alleged actions are detailed, criminal, and downright disturbing. And just a few months ago, he was given the most guaranteed money in NFL history. $230 million. Fully guaranteed. My name is Jackson Kruger. This is The Monster. When this monster entered my brain, I will never know. But it is here to stay. How does one cure itself? I can't stop it. The monster goes on and hurts me as well as society. Maybe you can stop him. I can't. That's a quote from one Dennis Rader, a former Air Force veteran who is now currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences at the Dorado Correctional Facility. He was charged with 10 counts of murder, also known as being a serial killer, a monster, if you will. Another monster by the name of Ian Brady, who was partially responsible for the murder of five children, once stated, we do whatever we enjoy doing. Whether it be deemed good or evil is simply for others to decide. To me, those quotes are rather chilling, right? I mean, I personally am not a psychopath. I mean, okay, I do make YouTube videos for a living, so like I'm probably not entirely all there. But still, I find it very fascinating, right? I mean, I think most of us wonder what makes a monster become a monster, and I find it fascinating that even monsters can't really explain it. Serial killers kill people because they like to kill people. So much so, in fact, they're willing to risk their entire lives and reputation just to do it, just for that thrill. Now, of course, Deshaun Watson never killed anybody, and to suggest that he did, or even just to compare him to serial killers, I think would be highly unfair and highly irresponsible, so that's not exactly what I'm doing. And that's probably the nicest thing I'm going to say about Deshaun Watson throughout the course of this video, is that you can't compare him to a serial killer. I should also probably say right off the bat that Typically, I like to make these videos relatively family friendly. I like to say PG-13. That's typically my uh, mindset when making a video, but I, don't, I just don't think I can do that with a video like this. I mean, like, let's just be honest. Like, this is such a screwed up situation that if we're trying to make it family friendly, we're just watering it down. So expect some gnarly things to be said throughout the course of this video. This video is rated uh, gnarly. That's the way that you can view it. Let's talk about a woman named Ashley Solis. Solis is a woman who is a licensed massage therapist who hopes to one day have her own office. Right now, she still runs her own company. Since she doesn't have an office, she usually just you know does her sessions out of her own home, and she markets herself through Instagram, which is not uncommon. What is uncommon, though, is who would end up reaching out to her. You guessed it, a certain well-known star NFL quarterback, which is obviously kind of odd at first glance, right? Imagine being just an ordinary person going through your average day-to-day -day life trying to start a business and get that off the ground, and all of a sudden a superstar NFL athlete comes up to you asking for a massage. That would immediately be confusing, right? And it gets stranger. Watson told Solis that he is looking for a relaxation massage. And Solis does not specialize in that. She specializes in sports therapy massages. So she told him that. And I think most people at this point would expect that to be the end of the story. Watson would say, oh, okay, I see you don't specialize in what I, I'm looking for. So I'll just go find somebody else, uh, you know, go our separate ways. That's it. That's the end of the story. Not quite. Perhaps that could have been a red flag, but that's always easy to say in hindsight. I mean, personally, if it were me, I don't know if I would necessarily expect the worst right off the bat. 
And also at the same time, Solus was excited. And why wouldn't she be? I would be too. I mean, just think about it. If you're someone who's trying to grow a sports therapy massage business and you're trying to get it off the ground, well, wouldn't it be a great thing to put on your resume to say you've worked with a top athlete in the world? It could add a ton of legitimacy to her business. And also it's just like kind of exciting, right? I mean, like, listen, uh, I know that as a society, we kind of worship celebrities to a weird extent, but at the same time, it is still fun to meet a celebrity. I remember my brother used to work at Subway, and one time, uh, Guy Boucher, the then head coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning, walked in and my brother made him a salad. It's a totally small story, but he still tells it years later. I would too. It's cool. Solis agreed to do it, and before it happened, Watson messaged her and said, is there anybody else I'm expecting to see there? Which is weird, right? I mean, right off the bat, if it's just a regular massage, why would you care if someone else is in the building? Why would you care if there's anyone else there? But there actually might be a reason. Deshaun Watson is a well-known public figure, and I'm sure there's public figures who don't like a lot of people around them because, you know, People who are fans of that public figure can sometimes probably be pretty annoying. I'm sure Guy Boucher was wishing he went to a different subway after the 100th question my brother asked him about Steven Stamkos. Solis assumed that was the explanation for why Watson was seeking privacy, let him know that th it would just be her and the massage would happen. So the massage was about to start, but first Solis left the room to give Deshaun Watson some time to change, which is customary during massages. While this happened, Solis eventually came back into the room to find Deshaun Watson wearing just a very small towel covering his groin area. Other accusers have described it as a hand towel, so is covering his groin but not leaving too much to the imagination. Throughout the massage, Watson would aggressively dictate how he wanted the massage itself to be done. He also said things like, don't use your knuckles, don't use your elbows, only use your hands. Solis felt pretty clear at this point that Watson just wanted sex. That's the vibe she got from how this was going. And typically, if it was just a normal client, she would have just walked out, right? I mean, chalk it up to a crazy experience from someone you met on the internet, and move on with your life. But this is no ordinary client. Remember when we talked about the positive benefits that Watson could give Solis in her career? Well, the opposite is just as true. Let's say Solis confronts Watson, which at the time she wanted to do. So let's say she does that, Watson freaks out, and then posts something negative on social media about the situation. That is very much not good on your resume if when people Google you, the first thing that comes up is a star NFL athlete saying that they hated the way that you run your business. Solis reluctantly continued the massage, and as she did, Watson would consistently try to direct her towards his penis, even at one point purposely taking the tip of his penis out of the towel, which exposed his fully erect penis. At this point, Solis became frightened enough to where she started crying. She was fearful as to what could happen next, what Watson could potentially do to her. Let's play a game. This game is called, What Do You Do? Here's how the game works. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer it in your head. That's how this game is going to work. What do you do if a masseuse starts crying because you exposed your erect penis to her? Well, what Watson said, and I quote here, I know you have a career and a reputation, and I know you would hate for someone to mess with that, just like I would hate someone to mess with mine. So let's consider this a threat, as any sane person would. The incident eventually ended. Watson and Solis went their separate ways, but it wasn't quite done there, so Watson would reach out later to apologize to Solis. Solis did not respond. Weeks later, two NFL players reached out to Solis saying that Big D recommended them. And while you can't really say for sure that it was Deshaun Watson who recommended them, it's really kind of feels that way. I, I certainly wouldn't bet against it. Since this incident, Solis has suffered from depression, panic attacks, and anxiety. She says that she sometimes even blames herself for this incident as horrible as that sounds. And so do the other 23 women who have come forth with allegations against the monster.
That was Ashley Solis's story, the first of what would eventually be 24 lawsuits and counting against Deshaun Watson. And don't worry, we'll get into the other 23 later on in this video. But first, it can't be understated how important it is to talk about the fact that these are still just allegations. And while some of those facts can be confirmed, such as the fact that the appointment happened and such as the fact that Watson would go out and apologize for making her cry, those facts can be confirmed. The rest of it is still Solis's telling of the story. And that's an important thing to note because you still can't know exactly what happened in the room if you weren't there. Our criminal system is set up for innocent until proven guilty, and it's really hard to prove something like this when only Solis and Watson can truly know unless there was a recording or something, which there was not. That's what makes these cases so difficult to prosecute criminally, and also what makes it so difficult to prove your name if you are in fact innocent. Now, it's worth noting, every study I've read says that false allegations are incredibly rare. Uh, every study I've read says it's somewhere from 2.5% to 8%. I haven't seen any outside of that block. Meanwhile, figures from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics state that probably only around 35% of sexual assault cases are even reported to the police. Interestingly, the most common reason for a false allegation is actually a teenage girl trying to get out of trouble. In fact, most false allegations are actually motivated by emotional gain as opposed to by financial gain. Something like, I didn't cheat, it wasn't consensual kind of thing. The odds of a false allegation are low. The odds of a false allegation due to financial reasons are even lower, but they aren't zero. And they are just allegations. I'm sure that's something a lot of NFL executives have been saying these past several weeks. Prior to the allegations, Watson had requested a trade from the Houston Texans. It was largely in part due to his frustration with owner Cal McNair. Basically, uh, Watson wanted to be involved of the new GM hiring process as they were about to hire a new general manager. Cal McNair told Watson he would be involved in the process, but then hired a new GM without Watson's knowledge. So the Texans were looking at who they could trade him to, but once the allegations happened, all those trade talks got put on hold. Throughout the 2021 season, Watson sat out every single game due to the allegations, although worth noting, he did still collect a paycheck. Now, fast forward to March, 2022, he was cleared of any charges from the grand jury. So while there's still civil suits pending, uh, although some of those have been settled as well, the fact that he's not going to prison kind of opened up the NFL's eyes a little bit. NFL teams saw this as a green light. Watson was in the clear and he was an asset again, and a pretty damn good one. Pro Football Focus ranked Deshaun Watson the last time we saw him in 2020 as the third best quarterback in football. And for the most important position in football, getting a player of that caliber, there's no price too high. Now here's where things get interesting from a strictly football perspective for a second. Deshaun Watson had what you call a no trade clause. He's one of the few players in the NFL who has that, meaning that he can only be traded if he consents to being traded. If a team tries to trade for him, but he doesn't want to go there, he can say no, and he does not get traded. So the Texans are totally willing to move on from him, but they do not get the final say here. Deshaun Watson does. Watson was essentially a free agent just with a couple of extra steps, and there were teams interested in him. The Atlanta Falcons, Carolina Panthers, and New Orleans Saints all allegedly pursued him heavily. However, he went a different route, deciding to sign with the Cleveland Browns, who at first it made some sense, right? I mean, they were the team that's the most competitive currently. They had the best roster around the quarterback position. So him going there gives him the best chance to win a Super Bowl. But there was more to it than just that. The Browns would add a sweetener. Brown's GM, Andrew Barry, would offer Watson a contract extension worth $230 million fully guaranteed, the most guaranteed money ever given to a player in NFL history, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. That would be wild enough on its own, but it gets greasier. Cleveland worked the contract in a way to where the first year of Watson's deal, he's making as little as you can make in the NFL. Why are they doing that? 
Well, because if you get suspended, then you lose the money from that game check. So what they're doing is they made those game checks as little as possible and paid him more of that money in different years. So the rest of those years, he's getting paid a lot more and he signed a pretty hefty signing bonus. He got a $45 million check just for writing his name down on the paper and that's money he's already received. So if he gets suspended for a year, out of the $230 million he just got with that contract, he'd still be getting $229 million of it. Now, it's possible that he could get suspended for more than one year. That has happened a few times in NFL history. Frank Philhock and Merle Hapes were suspended for life after fixing the 1946 NFL championship game. You have people like Ray Cariff, Michael Vick, and Plaxico Burris who were all given indefinite suspensions until they got out of jail, basically, and so they were able to return after that, which took over a year for all three of them. But that's it. So for Deshaun Watson, it's possible he gets suspended for over a year, but if he did, it would literally be unprecedented, as there's never been a player to receive a suspension that long who didn't get convicted of a crime or fix the league. Honestly, I just can't see him getting suspended for over a year. It's possible, I could be wrong, but I think that he'll probably get a year or less. I think the Browns plan is gonna work, and I think that Deshaun Watson is gonna basically get the lightest of slaps on the wrist from the NFL. And as fucked up as it is that the Browns did this, we can't forget that the Saints, Panthers, and Falcons all tried to do this as well. The only reason they didn't is because Deshaun Watson said no. And there could have been more teams interested in it that we just didn't hear about. We really don't know. Now, throughout all this, most of us felt bad for the Houston Texans. I mean, you have the star quarterback, all of a sudden, you know, he requests a trade, and then all of these horrible accusations come out. That's a really unfortunate situation to be put in. But apparently, they might not be totally innocent in this either. One day, Deshaun Watson went to his locker in the locker room and found an NDA, or a non-disclosure agreement. It was put there by the team director of s security for the Houston Texans. Watson would then take that NDA to massages. Watson allegedly, at one point, tried to get a woman to perform a sex act on him, and when she refused, he said he was not going to pay her unless she signed the NDA, which she eventually did. While this at first seems pretty damning for the Houston Texans, apparently it might not be. It actually is, from what I understand, somewhat common for well-known celebrities to have people sign NDAs in rather normal circumstances. People use NDAs for whatever, but like if someone, let's say, I don't know, Tom Brady has someone clean his house. I would imagine he probably has that person sign an NDA. That's normal, I think, when it's big time, high profile people and people are around their family or whatever it may be. But the fact that the team is involved, that's what makes it weird, I think. Now, that's not all the Texans have had a hand in. The Texans also, uh, at a certain point, put Watson in a place at the Houstonian Hotel, and Watson would then use that place to perform some of his massages, if you will. Now, Watson has denied that the Texans knew what he was doing in there and knew that there were massages being had in there, which, again, to me, seems at least plausible. However, Tony Busby disagrees. He's the lawyer representing the woman in this case. He said, We believe the Texans organization was well aware of Watson's issues, but failed to act. They knew or certainly should have known. The Houston Texans organization provided rooms for Watson at the high-end Houstonian Hotel for his massages. The Texans also provided massage tables and other support for Watson's proclivities, ostensibly to protect their asset. We intend to make sure all involved in Watson's conduct are held accountable in addition to and including Watson himself. I haven't been able to confirm or deny the claim that Watson was given tables by the Texans. Busby did say, this doesn't mean that the Texans knew what was going on, but they at least should have known. And to me, that feels at least kind of fair, right? Like, okay, listen, who knows what actually is happening, but there is probably enough evidence there to at least raise some eyebrows, right? But that's just a feeling. I mean, there really isn't strong enough evidence, in my opinion, from what I've seen, to suggest that the Texans knew or even should have known that Watson was up to some, you know, to put it way too lightly, not so great behavior. However, there is strong evidence to support that Deshaun Watson was helped 
by the Houston Texans. Not much we know, and that's probably something that should not be happening. Uh, for me, one thing I thought of is perhaps the NFL should just sort of implement some kind of policy where if you do provide someone with an NDA, there has to be just some level of investigation involved in it as well. If there's a policy involved and you make teams do stuff like that, well then Watson isn't gonna be offended if you're saying, well, we have to check through these doors just because you have to check through those. That's what the policy is because really teams aren't gonna willingly do that kind of stuff on their own especially not when it's for a person who throws a ball very well. I really do understand why some people come down so harshly on the people that helped Deshaun Watson do this. And I don't necessarily disagree. I think we probably should hold those people accountable. I also think it's fair to say, I think a lot more people than we realize would have also done the same thing in that situation. I, like most other people, first heard about this story when Deshaun Watson tweeted out about this story. He said the following, as a result of a social media post by a publicity seeking plaintiff's lawyer, I recently became aware of a lawsuit that has apparently been filed against me. I have not yet seen the complaint, but I know this. I have never treated any woman with anything other than the utmost respect. The plaintiff's lawyer claims that this isn't about money, but before filing suit, he made a baseless six figure settlement demand which I quickly rejected. Unlike him, this isn't about money for me. It's about clearing my name and I look forward to doing that. This tweet worked as intended. They say if you release the story, you can control the story. And that's absolutely what happened here. I went back and looked at old tweets from right when that story broke and they were overwhelmingly in support of Deshaun Watson. The vast majority jumped to the conspiracy theory that the Houston Texans themselves were behind this. There was no evidence to support that theory, but that's never stopped the internet before. Now again, to be clear, I'm not saying anyone should have just assumed guilt right away. False allegations are rare, but they do happen. So being skeptical is totally valid. But it was just a little jarring for me seeing how few people took the allegations seriously right away. I mean, at least on places such as like Twitter and Reddit, which I totally understand is not a totally valid representation of America, but still, I do wonder what would have happened. What would have happened if that was the only allegation? How many people would have ended up siding with Deshaun Watson? Unfortunately, we were just getting started. One of the least enjoyable things I've had to do for my job here on YouTube was in the making of this video. During the research section of preparing for this video, I had to reach, read through each one of these allegations. And let me tell you, listening to a bunch of women describing their sexual assault stories, not exactly my idea of a entertaining Sunday afternoon. However, it was very important as I certainly got the picture of what Watson would do. They all started off the usually the same way. Not exactly, but most of them started off the same way. Watson would reach out to these women, typically through Instagram, although not always. Like, for example, one woman uh, he reached out to through, she worked at a spa, and he reached out to her manager. Although, weirdly enough, he asked to see a picture of her before agreeing to do the massage. Also, when he reached out to one of the women on Instagram, he said, I make a lot of masseuses uncomfortable. It's really hard for me to find someone who will fit my needs. Definitely in hindsight, a very weird quote. Okay, side note, I have a question for you. If you are getting a massage, how important is it for you, for the massage therapist you hire, to be good at giving massages? It's a silly question, right? Of course, that's all that matters. Well, not for Watson. One of the victims is a personal trainer. And when Watson reached out to her asking if she does massages, she said no. Despite that, Watson still wanted to book her. Another woman owns her own skincare business. And when Watson reached out to her, she assumed Watson just liked her facials. But no, that was not the case. Watson wanted a massage. And when she said she does not specialize in relaxation, Watson said it was fine. And she wasn't the only woman who focused on skincare that Watson reached out to. The woman from Lawsuit 12 also focuses on skincare and had no training with massages, but Watson said it was irrelevant and booked her anyway. In fact, he even said under oath 
that being skilled was not a priority for him. There were several instances of him asking women to sign NDAs, which again, to me seems crazy, but apparently for some celebrities that might actually be normal. So I really can't say. Also, a decent amount of these women were single moms, which again, could totally be nothing. For all I know, there's just happens to be a large section of the massage therapist community who happen to be single moms. Maybe that's just something that happened. But it did get me thinking, right? I mean, if you're a predator and you're looking for someone to go after, why not a single mom? Go after somebody who has a lot to lose. Again, this totally could just be random and I have no reason to believe otherwise, but it is still a drop in the red flag bucket. Before a large number of these sessions, Watson would tell a woman where he wants the massage to take place or what the focus of the massage should be, which is totally normal. What is weird is that he would consistently say he wants his groin and glutes area to be the focus of the massage, which again, in a singular instance would mean nothing to me. But when you look at the pattern of behavior, it definitely starts to form with how many times he said that to these women. Another pattern that would emerge is how many times he specified that he wanted privacy. He would consistently ask women if there was going to be anyone else there and say he didn't want any other anyone else there. He also, one time at a spa, requested to use a back entrance. There were also things like, you know, one time a masseuse said that you could use her office, but Watson said no, he demanded for it to be used in his house instead. And there were instances where Watson just told the woman to dress comfortably, which again, starting to show a pattern of behavior. Anyways, this, again, what we've gotten here, no criminal acts have happened, only weird stuff it starts to get weird from this point on. So in a typical massage, what happens from what I understand, not a massage guy myself, but from what I've read and from what I understand, someone will, you know, the person about to get massaged will enter the room. The massage therapist will leave the room, give the patient kind of a minute to get undressed, get changed, uh, get under a towel, all that good stuff. And then the massage therapist comes back. And this is where the trouble would arise as typically one of three things would happen. Now, option one was normal behavior. He would be covered like you would expect him to be, and maybe there'd be something like he would ask for a top sheet to be off or something, but still covered, totally fine. Option two was the one that happened to Solus, which is he was wearing a small towel, kind of covering himself, but very much just kind of covering himself. Apparently he would bring the towel from home. He wouldn't get it there because a lot of these places don't have hand towels just right there readily available. Or maybe he was just concerned that they wouldn't have hand towels available. I feel like some would, right? Very, very bizarre. But still not as bad as option three, which is exactly what you probably guessed. He would be completely naked. The various victims here would react in different ways, as you would expect. They're different people. Some would ask Watson to put the towel on and he would respond with, I get hot easy, which is actually something he said throughout a lot of these allegations is he used that phrase, I get hot easily as an excuse to not wear much clothes. One woman simply just tried to cover him up with a blanket when she saw he was naked and he immediately took it off. And for the times he was wearing a towel, usually he would slowly take that off as well. Sometimes the woman would assume it was an accident and kind of put it back on him only for him to take it off again. Watson would direct the massage therapist aggressively, constantly telling them where they should go and what they should do, and usually eventually instructing them to move closer to his genitals, oftentimes even adjusting his body into a way where their hands would brush up against his genitals. The exact details in each of these case obviously vary. Sometimes at this point he would compliment the woman, sometimes he would try to kiss them, Sometimes he would grope them, such as in lawsuit 22, when a woman claimed that Watson grabbed her butt, became erect, and th told her that she could sit on it. She ended the massage instead, but not before Watson made her sign an NDA. Also, on multiple occasions, Watson talked women into, and I quote here, penetrate his anus with their fingers and massage him there. There were times when he ejaculated multiple times on the woman, one of which he started furiously masturbating right after and grabbed the woman's hand and touched her hand with his penis. In lawsuit 15, Watson had a small towel on him, but turned over to expose his erect penis, which had pre-cum leaking out of it, 
and said, I hope you don't mind if we can continue the massage like this. The victim was startled and just started stuttering, I don't know. She did eventually end the massage, but when she did, Watson asked her for a hug while still being completely naked. The victim refused, and when she did, Watson said, oh, come on, I saw your Instagram, I know what you're working with. When she said she had to leave, Watson responded with, all okay, but if we had time, what would we do? This is fucked up stuff from Deshaun Watson. That was one of 24 allegations. There were also instances of like a normal or only slightly abnormal massage that would eventually be followed with a very abnormal massage. And one example was in Lawsuit 9, when there was actually multiple examples of very horrible instances happening. In their first session that they would have together, the woman and Watson, Watson would grope her butt and vagina and shove her butt into his face. And when she said, what the hell are you doing? Watson responded with, oh, I thought you liked that. Later, Watson requested her to remove the oil from his body. But when she grabbed a towel, he said, no, I want you to only use your hands. Of course, as you probably expected, when she used her hands, Watson would then brush up his penis against her hands. Watson finally left, but only paid $100 out of the $300 he promised the woman. The session was booked by her manager, and when her manager asked Watson why she didn't receive the full $300, Watson said, well, he didn't get what he wanted. This would be horrible enough, but unfortunately, it does not end there. As a what appears to be a complete coincidence, Watson reached out to her on Instagram DM, and she didn't realize that it was him, so she booked another session. Now, when Watson arrived, she immediately recognized him, and I can not only imagine how frightening that situation might be. I don't know what I would do if I was in her shoes, but what she decided to do was just tell him, listen, no inappropriate stuff can happen. She told him last time was unacceptable and that she's a lesbian, so there's no chance anything's going to happen. And Watson agreed and still accepted that, you know, everything's fine. No inappropriate behavior. Okay. As you might have guessed, Watson would not behave himself. During the massage, at one point, he grabbed her hands, shoved them up his anus, and said, and I quote here, I can tell you're a lesbian because you're so good with your fingers. Watson told her to make him come, saying that other masseuses make him come. She also told him to kiss and suck on his chest. She responded with stop acting like a pervert, but she did not leave. Why? She didn't want to lose her job. That's the crazy situation that these women are put in. Watson asked her to pretend like he's a woman and perform oral sex on him, which my first reaction to that was like, that's not how that works, dude. While the absurdity of some of Watson's comments come across as silly, the reality is truly horrifying. He'd go on to say there's a first time for everything, wrap his legs around her neck, and tell her to kiss and suck on his penis. Thankfully, she was able to release her head, and when she did, Watson started furiously masturbating until he ejaculated. There were multiple instances of Watson coercing these women into actually performing oral sex on him, and one where he coerced a woman into intercourse. Unfortunately, the impact of Watson's actions did not end there. For one, he would often ask for return visits. One woman as many as seven different times he reached out to, despite the fact that she ignored every single one of those. There are victims that would end up suffering from depression, anxiety, trouble sleeping, and panic attacks, among more things. Many of the women ended up leaving their jobs after this incident. At least, that's what they've alleged. Those are the allegations. 24 allegations. Maybe even more, because by the time I started writing this script, it was 22, so perhaps more will come out by the time that I actually finish editing this video and post it. Not to mention all the women who were sexually assaulted that just didn't come out with a lawsuit about it, of which we know there are at least some. In Texas, rape is defined as penetration through the mouth, anus, or sexual organ without their consent. That simple. Now, what can be a little bit more complex is how exactly do you define consent? Texas law defines consent as a set in fact whether express or apparent. Personally, I'm not a lawyer, but to me, this is pretty clear. 
for penetration to occur, the one getting penetrated must make it absolutely clear that they're okay with getting penetrated. But it also says the word apparent. And for Watson, he could potentially argue that when he simply looked at each of these instances, he felt it was apparent to him that all these acts were consensual, that the woman did want it, even though we would all disagree, the court of public opinion would disagree, but would the court of law disagree? Just because of how subjective that word apparent is, the reality is apparent consent for someone is not apparent consent for someone else. Now, to be clear, I do understand why the law is written the way it is. I personally don't know how you can construct a sentence that definitively and detailedly describes every single non-consensual sexual act without describing a single consensual one. So the only real thing you can do is leave it kind of vague. So I totally get it, but still, it's just one of those things that makes these cases so difficult. Also, this is completely unrelated, but did you know that in Texas state law, there's these things called sodomy laws, which basically means that gay sex is illegal? But in Texas, it's not illegal to have sex with a 17-year-old. So, like, that's weird and probably shouldn't be the way that it goes, right? Now, to be clear, if you are living in Texas, you are legally allowed to have gay sex, as sodomy laws were deemed unconstitutional in the year 2003, which is, like, not that long ago. Also, why are they called sodomy laws if it's just banning gay sex? Because that's not what sodomy is. Straight people can sodomize, too, if they want to. So even the grammar is off about this. Basically, Texas needs to get their shit together. Anyway, this is not a Texas court, and I just think we should be very clear in saying that in this circumstance, Deshaun Watson is not just being accused of sexual assault. He is, by definition, being accused of rape. The devil is building a fence around hell. And as the devil is doing this, God looks over, looks at the map he has of the heaven and hell border, and realizes that the fence that the devil built is about 30 feet over the heaven and hell border. This is frustrating for God, and he's upset about it. So naturally, he goes over to the devil and says, listen, what are you doing? This is way over the line. He hands the map to the devil. The devil looks at it and says, yeah, you know what? I guess you're right. I did my measurements wrong. Uh, this fence is over. The line and so god says all right well are you gonna fix it now and the devil says no i'm not gonna fix it i mean listen this fence is super expensive and it's all connected to each other so i would have to tear down this entire fence if i wanted to and start in start over get a new one i don't have the money for that kind of thing sorry but the fence is just gonna have to stay god is upset about this you can't just take a section of my property god says to the devil and the devil says i'm sorry but this is just what i have to do God is very frustrated now. He roars back to the devil. Listen, man, if you're going to sit here and try to take some of my property, I'm going to have to press charges. The devil, instead of getting frustrated back, just starts laughing. God gets more annoyed. Why are you laughing? Says God. The devil simply smiles and says back, you're going to sue me? Where on heaven are you going to find a good lawyer? It's a cheesy joke. I know. Uh, my uncle told me that one when I was younger. He is a lawyer, so for whatever reason, he loves those kind of lawyer jokes. I'm not really sure why, because I'm assuming it's not that he thinks all lawyers are evil. He was one. And personally, I don't think all lawyers are evil either. I think it's a very important aspect of our legal system to have smart people with a deep understanding of the law argue each and every point about that law. That logically makes sense to me and is very important. That being said, I can certainly see why lawyers have a bad rap. Anyways, the two lawyers in this case are Tony Busby and Rusty Harden. Rusty Harden represents Deshaun Watson, while Tony Busby represents the woman. Deshaun Watson is not the first well-known athlete that Rusty Harden has represented. He's represented the likes of Scottie Pippen, Adrian Peterson, Warren Moon, and many others. Probably the most notable, though, has to go to Roger Clemens. He defended Clemens when Clemens was accused of using steroids. He was accused by Jose Canseco, who even said that Clemens was the one who initially told Canseco that he should try steroids. And he was also accused by someone by the name of Brian McNamee, who was a personal strength coach for Clemens 
And according to McNamee, he on multiple occasions injected Clemens with an illegal substance. Harden simply referred to McNamee and Canseco as unreliable witnesses. Sound familiar to you in any way? Uh, you know, there's similarities, right? I do find it interesting because these cases are relatively similar. Both are, there's a number of accusations, but no real hard evidence. Now, I would argue there's more hard evidence in the Watson case. For example, I think just having a lot of allegations could start to count as hard evidence, but even like actual evidence itself, we know Watson booked a ton of massages in a 17 month span. We know many of these events have definitely happened. We also know that Watson has even admitted to apologizing for making a woman cry during one of these massage, you know, situations. But still, the main question remains, how many accusations does it take to get you to believe something? Not think something happened, but believe it. Is it just one accusation? Two? 24? Is it even 100? Where's the line? Honestly, I don't really know exactly where the line is, and it's going to vary person to person. For what it's worth, Roger Clemens was not elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and usually you have to test positive for an illegal substance to not get elected, although it's worth mentioning he's had other controversies, so maybe that's what kept him out, but still worth noting, I think. All that being said, while I do find it pretty interesting, what does it tell us? Honestly, nothing. I mean, who is Rusty Harden? By all accounts, he seems to be a pretty great lawyer. If you go to his website, you'll find a very long list of awards and achievements he's you know, come up with over the years. And also, I just couldn't really find any real dirt on him when I was just doing research on him. If you were expecting this to be some sort of better call Saul style sleazeball lawyer, doesn't really seem to be the case. Of course, you never know what truly goes on behind the surface, what actually is happening. There could be stuff you know, behind closed doors that we don't know about, but you could say that about everybody. For all we know, it just seems like Harden is a pretty good lawyer and seems like a pretty ethical one, which honestly makes some sense, right? I mean, Watson knows how the situation is going to look. Watson isn't going to go out and hire someone who has some horrible past history that would look terrible for him. Watson picked Harden because Harden knows what he's doing and Harden has a sparkling reputation. I mean, the worst thing you can maybe say about Harden is that he sentenced 14 people to death when he was working for the state. But again, that's just working for the system and the death penalty is the death penalty. So while you could certainly make that argument if you want to, to me, that's just being a part of a system. I don't hold it against him. And I don't think you should, unless you're of the belief that all lawyers are evil. While Harden's biography might be a little bit vanilla, Tony Busby has enough pizzazz for the both of them. Busby was actually featured on the cover of the New York Times 10 years ago, and in that article, he was referred to as an entrepreneur of some kind, which I think is a pretty interesting quote. Although instead of like most entrepreneurs that are creating a business, he's finding some to tear down, or at least take a chunk of cash from. After Hurricane Ica, he stealed a claim from the Texas Winstrom insurance institution for $189 million. Of that $189 million of which, $4 million went directly into his pocket and another $7.5 million went to his company. He's collected over a billion dollars in total verdicts over the course of his career fighting these big companies. One of the companies he fought was BP during the infamous oil spill. He's also currently filed a lawsuit on behalf of 120 people against Travis Scott after the Astroworld Festival crowd crush situation. You could argue that he takes from the powerful and gives to the people, almost like a Robin Hood figure, if of course Robin Hood also took a cut off the top. There's also the political side of things. Back in 2002, Tony Busby would run to be a member of the Texas State House as a Democrat, but he lost by 17 points. 14 years later, in 2016, he would run a fundraiser for Donald Trump, although he would then go on later to disavow Trump, interestingly enough, after Trump's sexual assault allegations. Allegedly, he eventually voted for Dan Moran, who, no, I do not know who that guy is either. Um, I'm, I looked up a Dan Moran. The closest I could find was a politician in Missouri, but he doesn't seem to be that well-known. So it could be a different Dan Moran because he isn't well-known, but every other Dan Moran is less well-known than that Dan Moran. So. I have no idea. Interesting vote there, Tony. 
He would also give $500,000 to Trump's inauguration committee. So for, for whatever that is worth for you, there you go. Busby would go on to run for mayor in 2018, which I immediately thought, okay, this is going to be one of those Joe Exotic situations. I got it. Sure. Actually, no, he came relatively close to winning. He received enough votes to partake in the general runoff election, which he then received 44% of the votes. So he didn't win, but still, that's not bad whatsoever. And it's not that inconceivable to think he could potentially be the mayor of Houston someday, although he is not without his warts. Busby was arrested for suspicion of a DUI and was sentenced to a year of probation, but that suspension ended after just eight months, which was used against him politically. He's an eccentric character to say the least, and some hold that against him. Deshaun Watson did. Remember what I said earlier, the second this story broke, Watson tweeted out calling him an attention-seeking lawyer. In fact, if you go back and look up the old tweets right when this lawsuit was filed, a lot of people held his reputation against him. You saw a lot of people saying things such as, if you look up the history of the lawyer who is accusing Watson of this stuff, well, you start to believe the woman less and believe Watson more. Now, first of all, I just don't agree with that at all. I don't, I don't agree with that line of thinking. The reality is, even if you have a scumbag lawyer, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're guilty. Sometimes a scumbag lawyer is the best lawyer for the job. It's also worth mentioning that I'm not sure I would call Busby a scumbag lawyer. He's loud and flamboyant and makes a lot of money, but for the most part, it seems like he makes a lot of money for people who deserve to have a lot of money given to them as well. Rusty Harden got his job because he was perfect for Deshaun Watson and his reputation was clean, which is exactly what Watson needed. I think Busby's reputation is exactly what these women needed. He's a lightning rod. I mean, let's be honest, people can be vicious to a woman who accuses a well-known person of sexual harassment or rape. So for someone like Busby, this allows the woman to have a bit of a sense of comfort because instead of people saying, oh, these women are probably lying, they at least say, oh, Tony Busby is probably lying, which still isn't great, but it at least kind of gets some of the pressure off of the woman. There's less, oh, these women are just trying to make a quick buck and more, oh, that lawyer is probably just trying to make a quick buck, which is like probably true, that second part, that he's just trying to make a quick buck, but that's also literally his job. So I don't know if it's totally fair to fault him for that. Of course, unless you believe all lawyers are evil. Did you know that there are 339 different types of dogs in this world? It's true. Watch, I'll list them all off. So let's start with the A's. So you have Affenspitcher, Afghan Hound, Afrikanis, ID. Did you hear? Sorry, uh, someone's at my door here. Give me a second. Sorry about that. I just forgot that I ordered lunch. I pizza delivery man. Uh, I forgot that I was going to take a break for lunch. I'm in the middle of recording. Horrible timing too. I was right in the most important part of this video, the most exciting part of this video, and stuff like this happens. Uh, just awful luck, isn't it? Or is that what happened? I could be lying. I mean, after all, you didn't hear a doorbell ring, and the box I brought was a much smaller box kind of looks more like a box you would get from leftovers from the night before. I mean, think about it. I wrote this scene to have a moment like that come into play at a certain spot. So trying to time that up to get a delivery driver to actually come in in that instance seems incredibly difficult. The far more simple solution would have just been to put the box off screen, leave the camera for a minute and then come back and say, oh, hey, it was the pizza delivery driver. That's all that that was. Clearly what makes more sense would be that I just faked getting a pizza delivered. Or is that exactly what I want you to think? You see, this whole part of this video is about playing with your expectations. And so I actually did time up a delivery to happen right in this moment. It actually worked out pretty perfectly. That ended up being pretty good. The fact that you didn't hear a doorbell ring means nothing. This microphone is very good at blocking out background noises. So there you go. Or is that what I want you to think? You see, you have a guess as to what happened. You feel pretty confident you know what ended up happening, but you don't know and you can't prove it. 
And unless there's a recording of what happened, you have no idea of knowing without a shadow of a doubt if I got a pizza delivered or if I just grabbed a box from the night before. You probably think you know where I'm going with this, but I'm actually not. I'm going somewhere else. We're talking about the grand jury. The grand jury is another room where an event happens that nobody knows exactly what happened inside that room unless you were there. The grand jury declined to charge Deshaun Watson and from what I've read, that seems to be pretty significant because the grand jury is not deciding guilty or innocent. It's simply just deciding, is there enough evidence to go forward with the trial? It's worth noting, we're only talking about 10 of the 24 total cases here. Only 10 were criminal, the rest were civil. So that's an important note, but still, this is interesting. It feels like it should be pretty significant, but to be honest, I don't know if it is. It might be, I literally just don't know. I wasn't in the room when the event transpired. Nobody was. Well, okay, some people were, but only the people in that room really know because a trial like that is not available to the public the way a traditional trial is. So I'm sure someone in Watson's camp will point to this as a clear example of evidence to support that Watson is not guilty, but it's not quite that simple. One thing worth noting is I have heard that it is very rare for a no indictment to happen during a grand jury, although I couldn't actually find any hard data on it. Enough people have said it that I'm willing to accept it as true, but it is worth noting I could not confirm that. Also, as we've established, these kind of cases are notoriously difficult to prosecute. So if there is gonna be a no indictment on a specific case, it feels like a case like this makes sense for it to be on. Let's take a step back. Let's simplify things for a second. I'm gonna ask you a question again, doing that game thing again. How many sexual assault cases does it take for you to believe that someone is a predator. Again, not think, believe. As I said earlier, I don't know where that line is, but I just have to feel like that line is less than 24, at least for me. There were 26 women who would go on to accuse Donald Trump of sexual assault. 26. Really think about that for a second. If you're someone who is willing to make a false accusation, there is every reason in the world to make one about Donald Trump. If you don't like his politics, that would be a huge reason. The fact that he has a ton of money is a huge reason. And the fact that he cares so much about his reputation and would probably give you as much money as you, you wanted to shut up is a huge reason. But still, less people accuse Trump than people that accused Deshaun Watson. Again, doesn't prove anything, but is a major red flag. The reality is with Deshaun Watson, 24 women accused him of sexual assault and filed charges. At least six more accused him, but did not file charges. To me, that counts as evidence. To me, the fact that he saw at least 66 women in a 17 month span for just for massages, that counts as evidence. And in the spirit of being completely fair, some of those women have come out and said that uh, they gave Watson a massage and he was totally pleasant, but not all of them have, and the vast majority have not. For me personally, if I'm a jury, I probably wouldn't give him any jail time. I know it sucks, but like, can I conceive of a way that there is some grand conspiracy? Like, yeah, I can conceive of it. And I think that, you know, in our system, which is innocent until proven guilty, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, I think there is a very sl small sliver of a shadow of a doubt. So I think for jail time, I I'm okay with not giving him any jail time. That being said, I think there's just so much stacked against him. I would feel totally comfortable if I'm the NFL giving him a very harsh punishment. One idea that just kind of makes sense to me, I haven't heard this floated around at all, but I think it makes sense, is there is some precedent for this kind of stuff. Jameis Winston was accused of groping an Uber driver, and after he was accused of that, there was no hard evidence, but it was a she said something, he said something different. The NFL gave Winston a three-game suspension for that. So... To me, there's your answer. Three games per allegation. 24 allegations times three is 72 games, which is a little bit over four seasons. If you want to count last year as one of those years, that's fine with me, I think. I mean, the reality is, you know, he didn't play. Maybe you can find him for it and take away the money that he made that year. Whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, we don't need to get lost into details here. Then in 2025, the Browns would get a choice because they have Watson on their roster. They would get the choice to keep him on the roster and the contract would then just start as it's about to start now. It just starts three years later, just a delay there. 
or they could choose to cut him. And if they cut him, there is no penalty. Watson would clear through waivers. If a team wants to add him at that point, they can add him and they'll give him the contract. If no team adds him, the contract is null and void and he becomes a free agent. At first glance, that punishment may seem harsh, but I honestly think that the punishment should be harsh for everyone involved, even for Watson. I mean, if you think about it, why was Michael Vick able to redeem himself in the court of public opinion? Was convicted of doing some horrible stuff, but now it seems like most people relatively like him. Why? Because he went to prison for several years. He had a harsh punishment, and there were consequences for his actions, which makes people more willing to forgive. For someone like Watson, we know he's not going to prison, but at least the harsh sentence from the NFL could get people to start to just be willing to potentially forgive him after he serves a punishment. It's the best thing for everyone involved for a harsh punishment. Most importantly, the woman, you know, the people that are like the whole point of all of this to get some sort of sense of justice. I'm sure they don't want to have to just turn on a TV and see Deshaun Watson just living his normal life. It'd be nice to get him out of the public eye for a little bit for them, I'm sure, and just get some kind of justice and prove that there is some kind of punishment here. Many of these women had to put their names on these allegations, despite the fact that they didn't want to, and their names have been absolutely dragged by idiots on social media at times. As I've said before, all of these women, to some degree, blame themselves at times. Many of these women have suffered from depression, anxiety, PTSD, panic attacks, the list goes on and on, and many of these women have left their jobs after the, these just horrible situations they've been put in by Watson. And while nothing can be done to change that at this point, the least the NFL could do, in my opinion, is not let him get away with it without any punishment or without a slap on the wrist punishment. Also, not to get too political, but this is probably why we should legalize sex work, right? I mean, the reality is that Watson, in a lot of these instances, came into this situation because he thought that the person he was talking to was a prostitute and he's not allowed to ask ahead of time because it is illegal. Now, obviously, the ethical way to go about this is not to just show up and start groping people and hope for the best. So it doesn't absolve Watson in any way, but it could at least, you know, get some women who are just trying to be masseuses out of a tough situation. Where do we go from here? What do we do at this point? I mean, Watson's probably not going to get the suspension that I think that he should get. The reality is, even if he did, he still is okay. Yeah, sure, the suspension would suck. Not being able to play football for over three years would suck. But even if he never plays football again and is banned for life, he's still fine. He's still made an absolute ton of money and never has to work another day in his life. But even that probably will not happen. The reality is, Watson will probably get away with this with just a slap on the wrist, and he'll probably help the Browns, who helped him out in this scenario, win a ton of football games. Now, one could argue, maybe that's okay. I mean, personally, I would rather live in a society where people get too many chances than not enough chances, so maybe it's not ideal, but okay. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's a fucked up situation that allows monsters to get away with rape. I mean, let's be honest. It's that one. It is that situation. Here's kind of the way I see it. Let's say that there are 10 men who have the same amount of money and notoriety that Deshaun Watson have and have been accused of the exact same thing Deshaun Watson was accused of. In reality, probably all 10 of these guys would be guilty. Now, maybe you could conceive of a scenario where only nine are guilty and one is innocent, but that seems very rare. However, in all 10 instances, the men would eventually face very little to no punishment at all. NFL GM Steve Keim famously said, if Hannibal Lecter ran a 4-3, we diagnose it with an eating disorder, which is an equally brilliant and horrifying quote. And it's not just about football. It's about us as a whole, as a society. I was trying to think if something like this could empower other monsters to commit such atrocities and make them feel like they have a better chance of getting away with it. But I actually don't think that's the case. It's possible, but I do think that Deshaun Watson did receive one very real punishment. While unfortunately it feels like nobody mentions the rape accusations, Deshaun Watson has been found guilty of sexual assault in the eyes of the public. The court of public opinion finds Deshaun Watson guilty of sexual assault. There is no denying that. 
And while the court of public opinion does not give any real punishment, they're always in session. Personally, for me, I typically don't love the idea of the general public getting the final say on stuff like this, because let's be honest, a lot of the vocal people on Twitter or on social media in general aren't even doing as much research as you've done watching an hour long video about it. I don't love the idea of the general public having the final say on serious issues like this. But this is the upside. Knowledge is the sword of the oppressed. Voices are the sword of the oppressed. Is internet vigilante justice good? I don't know. It might be horrible. Or it might be the only way to avoid the known injustice we get without it. My name is Jackson Kruger. Thank you very much for watching.